welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Right, here we go. What you think about Well, welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I hope you enjoyed our opening music. It's called Clarion Call by the Mark Arneson Band, featuring Maya Dore. And if you like it, you can go ahead and download it on any of your favorite music platforms. Now here on Alzheimer's Speaks, for those of you that are new, we are about sound information, not just sound bites. We wanna hear what's really going on in the industry of dementia care. And so we like to raise everyone's voice around the world, those diagnosed families, children, researchers, a variety of business professionals, musicians, authors, you name it, everybody has a place at Alzheimer's Speaks. And so you could be our next guest. Reach out to me. I would love to talk with you. Now, before we go in and talk about our show on Parkinson's, I want to give a shout out to a few organizations that I think are just really important. One is the Memory Cafe Directory. This is a lifeline to so many people because it allows people with dementia and their care partners to be together and develop a new group of peers that is just really solid and helpful. Now, I personally facilitate three memory cafes. Two are with Arthur's Senior Care on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month at one o'clock. The other is with Artist Senior Living on the third Wednesday of each month. And um, again, both of those are at one o'clock central time. I also have to give a shout out to Dementia Map. Um, my co-founder and I, uh, Dave Weidrich, developed this. It is phenomenal. We just launched it right before the holidays, but are getting a fantastic response from not only families, but business professionals shocked at what resources are out there. And we've just touched the tip of the iceberg. So check out DementiaMap.com. And if you'd like a tour, please reach out to me. I would be more than glad to give you a tour because it is way more than just a resource directory. It also has events and an informational blog. Coral Health is also an organization that is allowing people to download two of their apps, Music First and Coral Faith, during the pandemic. So please visit CoralHealth.com. That's C-O-R-O Health.com. And we're going to hear from the Foot Bar Walker, and we'll be right back. Introducing the life-changing Foot Bar Walker. I'm Peggy from Danville, Kentucky, and I'm 91 years old. The Foot Bar Walker revolutionized my care of George. It absolutely benefits the patient and the caregiver both, and that's the beauty of it. It's so easy to use. It folds up just like a dream. I got it in and out of the car without any effort at all. The saving that I made from having to put him in a nursing home came to about $192,000. Does someone you love use a walker? Do they struggle? to get up from a seated position? Are you a caregiver dealing with physical pain and stress as you help your patient? The Foot Bar Walker was designed to assist not only the patient, but also the caregiver. Patients have more control standing up and no lifting from the caregiver is required. See how it works at thefootbarwalker.com. That's thefootbarwalker.com. Peggy, would you recommend the Foot Bar Walker? Do I ever? I would not be in the health that I'm in today at this age had it not been for the Foot Bar Walker. Well, as promised, I said we're going to be talking about Parkinson's, and I'm so excited to have this conversation. And we have two fantastic people with us that are really going to give us some great information. The first is Richard Underwood. He is 56 years old and married, and he was diagnosed with Parkinson's at the age of 54. He is a really a positive thinker, extremely active in the global Parkinson's community. And he's also known as the rickety warrior uh, from the United Kingdom. He presents, he uplifts, he is uh, been on the BBC uh, television and other medias. He is truly a passionate advocate for the Parkinson's community. And he's always challenging the norm to make sure everything benefits 
benefits all. So welcome, Richard. How are you doing today? Not doing very well, thank you. Well, thanks for, for connecting with us. So next we're gonna talk with Lucy Jung. She is a design engineer who works on projects for people with Parkinson's. She's also the co-founder and chief executive at Charco Neurotech. And her partner is Dr. Floyd Pierre. And they have this vision to improve the quality of life for people with Parkinson's around the world. So welcome to you, Lucy. I, I can't Thank wait you. to talk about your technology. Now, before we get started, I always ask everybody, you know, how they've been touched um, by dementia, you know, Parkinson's in this case. And so, Richard, do you want to tell us a little bit more of what it was like for you to get uh, diagnosed, maybe share some symptoms that you had initially? Yeah, so um, my story actually started when I was 38, but I didn't realize I had Parkinson's. So 38 years old, I lost my sense of smell. So I can't actually smell anything at all. And I haven't been able to for all these 18 years. Um, I then sort of developed um, sort of fatigue, um, which led to a great extent where I used to be attending um, meetings with clients and I'd actually fall asleep at the meeting table um, and since um, I've been sort of uh, 56 years old I developed a tremor and I've developed um, stiffness all down my right side and weakness so that's really how sort of the Parkinson's has affected me um, but Parkinson's also has had its good side because of the many friends that I've met from all around the world um, from South Korea all the way around to California so that's sort of my story. It is amazing. I know uh, with mine as well, I, you know, I'm from Minnesota. I didn't really travel much. And now I know people all around the world. And it is fascinating how something like this you can, you can take. And while you're learning, meet so many wonderful people around the world. Um, it, it's absolutely fascinating. How about you, Lucy? Were you touched in your circle of friends or family or even yourself with, with Parkinson's or uh, any form of dementia? Yes, um, it's actually, well, my, my two grandmothers does have a Alzheimer's, but actually the, the story around Parkinson's, how we got involved is when I was at university, I always focused on projects for long-term conditions. So I worked on um, with people with uh, multiple sclerosis, people who had um, paralysis, so on. So, um, but it was like in 2013 when I first met with a um, gentleman who had Parkinson's, who shared his story, saying, "I'm very happy right now, but I look angry, and people think I'm angry all the time because Parkinson's took away my smile." And that really kind of shocked me and started learning a lot about what Parkinson's is and what kind of things that we can do for people with Parkinson's as the developers, as the engineers, and as the scientists. So as like Richard and yourself mentioned, I think that's kind of how we started and like-minded people started getting into together. And then, you know, we met amazing people down the line who have Parkinson's, who've really shared their time and um, expertise and their lives really with us to um, get to here. So that's kind of our story. We, we would say that they're kind of extended family and friends. Um, yeah, so that's kind of our story, how we got into um, helping people with Parkinson's. Wonderful, thank you. Richard, <clears throat> um, do you know how, how young somebody can be to be affected by Parkinson's? Yes, one of my very good friends had Parkinson's from when he was seven years old. And I've known of other people that have had it slightly earlier. Um, it does seem to be a disease that's affecting more and more young people. Um, so I know quite a few people in their late 20s and early 30s. Um, but I also have very good friends that are in their 70s. But of course, Parkinson's affects different people at different ages in different ways. So the younger generation may have a young family, may be working, and then they're basically received the news they have Parkinson's, um, which can affect them in a slower way normally when they're younger, but in a quite a devastating way financially. Okay. Um, oh, that's really interesting. I think a lot of people don't realize the span of this. It's kind of, uh, even when I think of, you know, my mom 30 years ago with Alzheimer's disease, everybody thought end stages, later life. And so a lot of awareness has to be brought 
uh, to Parkinson's as well as the, the variables and even for, for doctors to look for it in younger ages mm -hmm. as well, I think is important. I want to talk with you, Richard, about when you were diagnosed, how did it impact your life? Uh, did you have to quit work right away or you know, where did things stand or are you still working today? Um, well, basically, because I had it coming on for a sort of a number of years, like a lot of people, and they don't realise they have it. I was working during that period. But of course, when you look back during that time zone, I started to re start to realise now why I used to feel so tired, why I didn't have the energy levels. Um, when I was diagnosed, I did give up my job in um, when I was 56. And the main reason why, because it was making me so ill. Because basically to try and sort of combat the elements of Parkinson's, you're, re you're required to spend time and to be a little bit selfish on yourself. So that means doing exercise, socialising and doing other aspects. But when I was working, I used to come home from work and literally just fall asleep. So a trip to London to see a client would take me two days to recover from. Um, and I found since I've been at home, though I'm obviously very busy, um, I do find that I feel better in myself. Um, and so the sort of that's really sort of the story. You have got to look after yourself and also have the knowledge of how to look after yourself, which is key to a lot of these questions, which unfortunately, lots of people with Parkinson's and I suspect other neurological diseases don't fully understand the condition. And I'm not giving you information. Exactly. I think the world as a, as a global community has a lot to learn <clears throat> and a lot to share. And uh, again, that's one of the reasons I'm so excited to have you on. Um, Lucy, can you tell us a little bit about your, your company, uh, Charcoal, and um, what it's all about in some of the projects that you're working on? Yes, of course. So Charcoal um, started when we were at university. So um, it, the project started from Imperial University as well as um, Royal College Bart. It was a double master's course uh, called Innovation Design Engineering. And at that time, um, I actually had a um, previous project where we worked on a Parkinson's pen. Um, and it was basically using a vibration pen to help with the writing for people with Parkinson's where they often get a micrographia. Um, it is when their writing gets really small because of the stiffness of the Parkinson's. Um, but then I think the insight really kind of caught us and we wanted to further develop that kind of uh, theory. Um, that's kind of how we kind of spent years um, studying about how stimulation may help with people with Parkinson's in more greater time. And Q device um, really um, developed from there using focus stimulation and cueing phenomena that has been studied for many, many years um, from 19th century to help with their movement. And then the extra um, functions actually got added, for example, like medication alert, because we were working with people with Parkinson's and they've asked, you know, can you add medication alert to the device? So we added that um, because we are a team of, you know, scientists, developers and like clinicians, we were able to really um, dive into the science as well as the development, um, user experience and all of this and really developing this device to improve quality of life for people with Parkinson's in a various of way. Thank you. That's that's helpful. It's it's interesting. I didn't, I, you know, I don't know a, a whole lot about Parkinson's, I'll be honest. And so even when you were talking about the Parkinson's pen and the writing getting smaller, and I, I'm, I've learned a lot already. I can't wait to learn more. Richard, for you, I, I want to talk about, because you have such a, a positive attitude in terms of dealing, you know, with your Parkinson. What are some of the biggest um, achievements that you you feel you've made since you've been diagnosed? Um, I would say that the actual biggest achievement was producing a record um, that Lucy was on as well um, for a for a Parkinson's advocate out in Uganda and it was called One World One Voice Parkinson's and that raised enough money to open up one of the first clinics for Parkinson's in Africa let alone Uganda and that fundraising continues to today and only as yesterday, a hundred um, nurses and doctors were trained in Uganda about how to treat Parkinson's across the country. 
um, and that's run through two people in America, um, a few enthusiastic people from the UK, and a wonderful gentleman called Hannington, who doesn't have Parkinson's, but runs the centre out in Uganda. I think the other big achievement is, is some of the people that I've met and some of the programmes that I've been on. You know, I never thought before Parkinson's that I would be appearing on BBC, radio stations, doing presentations all over the world. And when I got invited to go to a neurological conference, neurology conference out in Rome, Italy, um, that was, I felt quite an honour to represent the Parkinson's community. And at the end of that, I had a standing ovation for how I presented the effects of Parkinson's on the general sort of people who suffer with the disease. Um, so I think meeting also all the people I meet across the world. So for example, last night for an hour and a half, I was dancing with my wife with 40 Parkinson's people across the world, run by a DJ from Italy and run by a support group in America. That is a positive experience because you're all there with Italians, UK, people from Nepal, people from Africa, people from the Canary Islands, and basically you all have fun. And part of Parkinson's to try and live with it and to progress is to be very, very positive. Um, and that's sort of really what I've always tried to achieve. I, um, I never look on the negative side, I always look on the positive. I love it, talking about the dancing group. Is that something anybody with Parkinson's can participate? And is there a fee for that or is it free? Yeah, no, it's all free and we have a dance every month. And uh, like I said, last night we had 40 people come on um, and we hope every month to increase that by 10. So that's held um, basically over Zoom. Um, and it's not just the socialization of it, which is the good fun. It's also good exercise for doing Parkinson's. And that's run by PJ Supports in, the, in America, basically by a lady called Isabel, who is a physiotherapist with about 20 years experience in Parkinson's. And so the dancing is also an exercise event as well as meeting all your friends. So if somebody wanted to join, would they like go to like Facebook or, or Google PJ support then? Or? Um, basically, they can come to my page as well, which is um, sort of Rickety Warrior um, on Facebook. And we, uh, we advertise it out as well with uh, PJ uh, Parkinson's in America. Okay. So then we put them all in touch and they get receive a code and they can just sign on via Zoom. Um, and basically, that's where you find the global Parkinson's community is sitting on Facebook and uh, sort of area, other areas on the internet. Okay. And all we can say is it's about having fun and being positive and, well and having the support of friendship. Oh, you've got a few different Facebook um, pages. One is Parkinson's Vision. Another one is Wickety Warrior and Parky and, and Wickety. And so we'll we'll list those up so people can can find those. Because I think that that is, you know, I think social engagement is so important to people. You know, when you have that healthy peer support and you can see, you know, fun and, or feel fun and kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel that I'm not just Parkinson's, I'm still a whole person, multifaceted. I, I think that's absolutely fabulous. So I hope we can help uh, help you uh, get those 10 extra people a month that you're looking for um, through this. I think that's absolutely fantastic. Lucy, can you tell us a little bit about your team at Charcoal and, and how you approach kind of your design and uh, in studies yes absolutely thank you um so our team members are like-minded people that we've got same vision we're such a small startup but they're incredible people with incredible skills and they are giving up their time they're giving up everything to just purely focus on how do we improve quality of life for people with parkinson's so every day in our discussions within an hour i don't know how many times people say things like you know, would this be useful for people with Parkinson's? Are we making sense? Um, we should go talk with people with Parkinson's. We should ask them because at the end of the day, our goal is to, you know, make people with Parkinson's smile. We have this um, agenda where we say, if we can make someone with Parkinson's just smile once more, once 
you know more in than usual life it, that is our success that is what we want and um we always say like the biggest achievement that we had was this lady who was um, helping us test um, key device from the beginning and she was testing the device and her improvement was quite significant where she said i really want to go back to my dance class i wasn't able to because of all the symptoms that i was experiencing so we were like yeah why not like let's bring you to the dance class and it, it just goes along with what richard and yourself mentioned about you know how important it is for them to go back to the community and we went with her with the device and she was like the, like I've never seen her so happy like just meeting her friends again and dancing and using the device and th that was something that we just wanted like that kind of smile um, so we pretty much work with people with Parkinson's all the time. We get on a Zoom. We ask Richard all the time about, do you think we are going through the right direction? We ask them to test the devices. I know Richard will uh, make a joke about him being our guinea pig, but like that we really are building code together with people with Parkinson's because the key point is understanding what is the most difficult and most frustrating thing for them and what they want to do as to what we want. So even like choosing the colors, um, initially I'm going to be honest, like our team preferred like the white kind of um, device, but then we asked people with Parkinson's and realized that they wanted a different color, which is the navy color that we currently have. And and they were right, like people with Parkinson's were right. We made the Pacific version and it was so much better. So it's it's just all about working together with um, people with Parkinson's and people around them. So I like that you're inclusive in terms of getting their feedback. Um, I think I think uh, companies are getting better and going deeper in terms of that. I, I, for a long time, I think there was a lot of superficial questions that were asked and not really in depth. And I love seeing that. And I love seeing that you really measure your success by smiles. As simple as that is, I think it's overlooked that the peacefulness and the joy and just the sentiment of, I feel good mm -hmm. is, is enough. You know, it doesn't have to be big and flashy and, you know, meet so, uh, so many different criteria sometimes a smile just says it all you yeah. know i think it's actually um richard have a great advice for us because we are at the end of say you know researchers we were doing so many measurements so you know the clinical studies that they do upgrs and all the tapping task and walking and we were just measuring the percentage and everything. And Richard was, like said something such, um, it's a really inspirational thing. And he said, like, what does these numbers mean? You know, 1%, 2%, you know, if it does make a difference to my life and I can take one more step in my life, then it's a miracle for like Richard. And I think that was such an inspirational thing for Sharko. So I think, you know, science is of course really important. So we are still doing all the, you know, scientific papers, clinical trials we're carrying out, but equally or even more, what's important is what people with Parkinson's feel and what is actually important to them. So it's balancing that um, two area is absolutely key for Sharko. Yeah, I, again, I think that that's a big area that is, is changing in research is incorporating um, kind of that um, psychosocial piece into everything because it's not, um, you know, it is important to any of us um, living how we feel. Uh, and, and so, and we, a lot of us don't understand all the technology and the measurements and, 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 and some people just don't even care. It's just like, make my life better. That's, you know, that's the goal. And I know that that's your goal as well. And that's researchers goal. So I'm not putting that down and I understand the need for that. But in terms of the communication to the general public, I think it's, received easier um, when you get to that core of, of how it's improving lives and, um, and how it makes somebody feel. And not just the person with dementia, but those that love and care for them as well, because it is a ripple effect there. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Richard, what excites you about life with Parkinson's? I know that that might sound like a weird question and people are like, really, Lori, <laughs> what's that one about? So why don't, why don't you tell people? Because I know that you, again, you like to look at things on a positive spin. So, so what excites you about it? 
Um, I suppose what I'm firstly, I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm sort of a bit of an extrovert and I've always been that way. So my mental health is is very good. Um, I think it's the sort of friendship that's, that I've developed and some of the challenges I've done. So the first thing I did um, when I had Parkinson was I did a charity walk with Parkinson's UK. And I have difficulty in walking long distances. So this was a 3.5 kilometer walk. So for me, it was like climbing Mount Everest. And I think the thing I, well, I found, I liked the challenge, but I also found the fun in it because when I arrived on my Nordic walking poles, the organizers of it who had never met me before, I think thought they were gonna need an ambulance to get me off the course. But me, my wife and uh, my daughter's boyfriend, we achieved a 3.5. We went up a very tall hill which um, was like climbing Kilimanjaro for me, got over the other side. And then because I also am quite a sort of emotional type of person, I was then clapped in over the finish line. And to this day, I've still got the medal I was given that sits next to my television. So whenever I feel a bit cheesed off, I always think to myself, look what you've actually done and achieved. And, um, and I think it's sort of meeting friends from everywhere, like out in Canada at the moment, where it's minus sort of 35 degrees where they are. And we, we tell each other jokes and I belong to um, a gym gym club where we all take the mickey out of each other. I mean, take the fun out of each other, have a laugh. Yeah, they all think I'm, they call me the naughty boy because I'm always in trouble with the gym instructor. But that doesn't matter. It's all about sort of friendship. Um, and sort of going back to sort of where Lucy was, sort of the the device, the Q1 that's been sort of been designed. I can always remember seeing the video of people they put out um, on YouTube, and I'm um, the first to say I actually cry because there was a, there's a lady on there, and I hate it when the video is played because it always makes me cry. And um, seeing the improvement the Q1 I had on people, so of course when you have the condition. You're looking for any answer that will actually help you. And uh, like, I, like I said to Lucy at the time, it's not about the stats. It's also about the other benefits that it gives you. So for me, the Q1 will help me walk. It will help me turn over in bed. It would allow me to go out of the house and walk a long distance again. And other benefits and also reduce the pain that I have in my legs. Now the Q1, I think, wasn't designed for some of these purposes. But that's the benefit. So it also has long term health problems. It allowed me to type more freely on a keyboard as well in my hands. So it's all these extra things that a little scientific device brings that aren't necessarily recorded by statistics. But I, I just would like to say to everyone really with Parkinson's is basically come and join the global community and have some fun. And I think that's the main sort of answer to the question. Great, thank you. Um, Lucy, let's talk about the Q1. Can you can you show us what it looks like and, and how it works? Yes, absolutely. So I've got it here. Um, it's actually designed for people with Parkinson's, um, the technology and science, as well as all the experience. So you can see the device, um, like it's charging. So it's actually all about making people with Parkinson's feel like they're getting a present. So it's like a jewelry piece, so giving it to you. And if you look at the sides, it's actually all designed for people with Parkinson's. So they do have a difficulty in grabbing things. So we actually made it lift it up a little bit so it's easy for them to grab. Every each step um, it has been taken. So we tested with Richard, gave us a lot of advice on you know how it's easy to bring adhesive out if there is you know big drawers and everything. It is using a medical adhesive, it is a medical device. Um, and it sits on the sternum and it gives a focused fibro tactile stimulation combined with the cueing phenomenon. Um, focus stimulation has been studied from 19th century when Professor Charcot actually first realized that people who come to him on a carriage ride uh, with the bumpy road had a better symptoms than him actually visiting them. So since then there was whole body stimulation, focus stimulation that has been studied a lot. 
And it is actually this focus stimulation that is showing a beta wave um, decrease, which is often shown in Parkinson's where it is um, actually increased, which translates to helping with the stiffness and slowness. And the queuing phenomena, it's actually when people with Parkinson's get freeze of gait, so they're walking fine, but suddenly they, they get fr frozen, so they can't take their next step. And if you give like a metronome type of a stimulation to them, either it's a sound, it's a visual or a tactile stimulation, it can kind of unlock their movement again to take next step. So it's as simple as that. The idea beyond the whole focus stimulation uh, cueing and bringing that into um, the discrete cue device is that you, it's not bothering your um, other sensations. So you can look at each other. So instead of having a visual stimulation, instead of listening to music, you can actually go out there, carry out with your daily life, but you are getting that benefit of um, the theories. So that's kind of um, where we are at. Um, yeah, so that is a cute device. Well, that's interesting. I, again, I wasn't aware of the the visual and the hearing cueing, you know, with Parkinson's. So uh, is it like the beat of music then, Richard, that that helps? Um, yes, I would say it is. I think music is very important, not just because it's uplifting, but it's the beat. So when I have a beat going, nine times out of 10, I can actually walk better. And uh, I'm, I'm afraid I listen to Lucy very carefully and, uh, in all our meetings and she tells me all these scientific facts and I, and I actually go away and I try it. So I actually work when I'm trying to walk now with patterns, sort of patterns of sound. So as a very simple, yeah, as a very simple solution, I actually touch myself. So I go, Perfect. yeah. And as I do that and I put my feet down on the, on the floor, I do find that I can walk better because Parkinson's is very peculiar. Um, I can walk down um, a path and I can walk at 80% of my previous capacity. I can then get 60% down that 80% of the path and then all of a sudden my legs stop. Now, I, I've always said to Lucy that I don't suffer with freezing. I suffer with complete stiffness. So my right leg feels as though it's got ton weights on it. So to give you an idea of how embarrassing the condition can be, which affects more people with Parkinson's than not, um, when I've been to the grocery shop and I've got my trolley, so my trolley helps me to go round, and I go round and do the shopping, and I'm fine, and I go down to get a tin of, uh, of beans off the counter, a can, and I go across the aisle, pick the can up, turn round, go try to go back to the trolley and I can't move because my leg has gone stiff. So on a couple of occasions, I've had to actually ask the shop assistant to bring the trolley to me so that I can sort of carry on. Um, and I've had that a few times. I've nearly been stuck on a train when it stopped at my station because I literally couldn't get out. Um, and these are all things that add up to people's sort of anxieties, worries, embarrassment. And that, in a lot of the things, is one of the biggest problems with Parkinson's is the number of people suffering with anxiety and depression that basically never know anything about local communities supporting Parkinson's and also national and global um, because they unfortunately hide behind the front door of their house, which is very sad. And that's a very, very, very it's a thing that I'm trying now to address locally nationally and globally. I really appreciate you giving the examples because I don't think people always understand what they're seeing. And in just being able to ask somebody if they if they need some help, you know, and be supportive, um, what a big difference that can make in somebody's life because you don't want people feeling shut in because what if, what if I lock up if I go out? That's gotta be a horrible, horrible feeling and you know we need to be a more compassionate society and accepting none of us are perfect and we all lock up in different ways <laughs> you know in this world it might not be a physical thing but you know we all have things that we're we're dealing with and, and have to overcome lucy can you give us an idea of visual cues that people could use as well 
Yes, absolutely. There are some of the devices that are out there. There is like laser shoes, laser canes that are helping with people with Parkinson's. And I believe also Richard have tried them. And um, the studies has been out there for like a long time. So I believe that there are people who can um, look into like visual stimulation, tactile stimulation and like auditory stimulation um, and try it out. They are non-invasive. Um, like I, I've even heard some uh, people with Parkinson's where they paint their floors into like a staircase where it kind of gives them a visual stimulation to walk past it. So um, I think it's all about kind of doing a little bit of um, like searching to see and test it out, see if it helps them, if it's not, because it's non-invasive, it, it's um, harmless. So. I think what, um, what's really important is for the research to kind of be out there, you know, instead of making really difficult, uh, like papers, if we can just make it really late um, and keep telling people, why don't you try that? Why don't you try that? Like as what I uh, told Richard, and I'm so glad that he's trying out this um, queuing phenomena because it has been studied for so long. It, this is so important, connecting actually the research to actual you know, the impact that it can make in daily life, people with Parkinson's, that's what Shark wants to do. So we always kind of read lots of clinical studies and we suggested to people say like, why don't you try this? It has been studied in the research. I mean, it seems like it, there is a potential that it can help you. Why don't you do this? Why don't you try this, that? I think that's another thing that Shark loves doing, um, working together with people and see if there's any non-invasive things, simple things that can make massive change for people with Parkinson's. Richard mentioned about this um, train story. And what we want to do with the Q device is just helping Richard get out of that train, let him go home. It's just one, two step that can allow him to, you know, avoid that embarrassment, moment, um, avoid that struggle and all of that. So Q is so much of like companion that we want um, for people with Parkinson's to have that they're okay, Shaku will take care of them, we will care about you, is what we want to do as a um, you know, startup. Wonderful. For the device you have that's put on the sternum, does that give out like a vibration? Yes, it's a vibration that has been um, tuned together with people with Parkinson's. So we tried out lots of frequency, amplitude, the location of the device, and also how the device, uh, like the material and everything had been actually really key to improve the, um, uh, the effectiveness of the device. So we were very, very lucky to have people like Richard, Marion, like um, Parkinson's UK, local groups who've kind of or, like participated in our uh, like testings to develop this. So we um, kind of tried out lots of um, different things to get to this point, which it seems like to date it is optimized um, uh, stimulation for people. Uh, we did actually give um, the op uh, like um, option for people with Parkinson's to change the parameters of the stimulation because every people with Parkinson's, they are all different. So they can change their parameters to fit their own needs. So that's what we've developed. Um, the science behind the focus stimulation, again, it goes quite in depth about, you know, reducing the beta wave in the, their brain activities. But we are actually studying a lot at the back of the scenes or to actually get down to the fundamental, um, you know, uh, like science behind this focus stimulation and queuing phenomena. Uh, we are getting there. And what Shaku really believes is being transparent, you know, like we are not coming up with the cure. Like there are amazing people who are working towards cure and um, prevention of Parkinson's and we are completely supportive of that. What Shaka wants to do is make impact into people like, like Richard's daily life now until we can find cure, until we can find prevention. So we are just taking this little part in this whole um, journey, um, just like do what we can do. Okay, so how, how do they um, get it to attach? Is it like a little sticky pad or? Yes, it is a medical adhesive. Um, like we've actually worn this adhesive for like like six months. Like some of our uh, male team members to shave their chest and see what is the right amount. So this is a medical adhesive that we're using. Um, so it uses that. It's like um like glucose monitoring device. Um, the device 
kind of sits using that adhesive to sit on your sternum. Um, the adhesive lasts for 14 days. Um, that is to minimize the irritation of the skin. Um, device can be just popped out, so it is separatable to charge the device and um, just give them freedom. It's waterproof. It is unless you want to go for a diving. So if you go under two meters, it might be an issue, but um, it is waterproof. It is sweatproof for people. Oh, cool. Now, Richard, have you tried this device then? Do you use it? Um, well, I have tried it and uh, I think uh, we, we've had problems in um, trying to speed it up, I think, uh, from my point of view, because of the pandemic, which has unfortunately got in its way. But the only way I can describe it um, to people was that when it was put on to me, I didn't even know that it was working. Um, because I know um, Lucy was saying about a vibration, but you can't even feel it. So the big benefits here for starting points is people are embarrassed. So now we have a device that is tiny. It can sit under your clothes, so people don't even need to know that you've got it. And it also vibrates, if I'm right, Lucy, to tell you when your medication is due. So again, that's getting over another embarrassment factor of people with mobile phones having alarms going off to take the next set of medication. So the whole device, nobody would know you were wearing it. And I'll be honest with you, when it was switched on, and um, it's no exaggeration for me, all my pain went within 10 seconds. Wow. So I um, have difficulty getting out of chairs because the top of my legs, around my hips and things, mostly because of one, the Parkinson's and the one, the way that I walk currently. Basically, I get quite a lot of aches, like very severe, like an arthritis ache going down my legs. The moment I switched the device on, that all went. And I would say that my walking was a lot better. Um, I felt a lot better. Um, and this is where I come from the point. I know we have to have the medical statistics, but for me, what a difference it made. And Lucy always says to me, don't get too excited. Yeah? But I think between me and Lucy, because I've also become very good friends with them all um, at sort of Charco, um, it always amazes me when Lucy says to me, don't get excited. And then I come on a program like this. And I can always tell that Lucy's getting excited as well. It, to me, it is a major game changer with helping people lead their lives in Parkinson's. So I've tested other devices. I've tested things from shoes to walking canes to other laser devices. Um, but this is something very, very different. Um, and I think it gives people an alternative to the care of their Parkinson's because it's all about managing it. And if you're suffering with no pain and you can walk better and you don't freeze so much, that gets rid of your anxiety and depression. Most people with Parkinson's can't turn over in bed, but with the device, I suspect I would be able to do that. So I can remember Lucy saying to me, well, how often would you put it? Because the device, if I'm right, it has three functions. It has an on and off. It has a function that I can press the button to get me out of a chair. Um, and it also has a function of, you can wear it all day until the battery runs out. So I can remember Lucy saying to me, well, what are you going to do? And I said, well, I want three of them for starters to get me through 24 hours at that time because I couldn't see any point in turning the device off. Um, and that's the difference it makes. But with Parkinson's as well, there's lots of peculiarities. Um, so to give you an idea, that's so um, I always make Lucy laugh at this point. I, so I have a certain what I call superhuman powers so I can run backwards, I can skip sideways, and I can sprint forward, and I can run down hills. My problem is I can't walk. And that's because, well, Lucy was explaining to me the other day that it's all to do, I believe, to with these beta waves. But lots of people with Parkinson's, when they get Parkinson's, they also develop amazing skills like painting, um, which is all to do with the brain being affected by the condition. So there are loads of people out in the world that have fantastic drawing skills, art skills, um, which they never had before. And lots of people who can cycle across America with Parkinson's and the UK, um, which they've never ever done before. So all of us have our own skills. 
um, and it is a very um, peculiar thing. Like I can hardly walk, but I can play ping pong, and I can also play um, a game called badminton very well to quite a high standard. But the moment I stop playing, and my path has since returns. Isn't that interesting? Yes, like I think um, Richard made a really, really great point. Um, like it is our brain. It's really difficult. Like we've got a science team. I, I'm not a medic myself. I'm not a neuroscientist, but our, we've got our team members who are. And we talk about this and we're evaluating. We're studying a lot about what's actually going on. At the end of the day, it is our body. It is a brain. It's really difficult to, you know, analyze everything what's going on. We are trying, but at the end of the day, I think what we always conclude after having like four or five meetings, just trying to understand our brain. At the end, we said, you know what? Like people with Parkinson's, they smiled. We should push on like, and just, you know, like we're developing the device. Um, Richard, we are trying our best to get the devices out there. Of, unfortunately, there was COVID. Um, and also we want to make sure that the device is developed in a safe way and everything. So we are going through all the medical regulations um, to make sure that it is safe for you to use. Um, but at the end of the day, I think like every people with Parkinson's are different. So every people with Parkinson's, they will each feel the uh, benefit in a different way. For some people, it will be like Richard, where it really changed them. In some cases, they might not see like effectiveness as much as Richard. That is why we always say don't get too excited because what we really don't want to do is make people with Parkinson's or any people with long-term conditions get disappointed because we are talking about health here. So we are really trying our um, best to you know, give a right expectation. That is why we're going through all the clinical research and um, all of that. But um, yeah, we, it, we are not going to give up. We will continue doing our best to, you know, develop Q1, Q2 and bring lots and lots of functions in so we can improve quality of life for people. You know, it was interesting um, when Richard was talking about, you know, what he could do, you know, like the, the ping pong and the cycling and the, you know, going backwards and things and, and then the walking. And the one thing that hit me and and I don't know if this is accurate or not, but to me, I thought all of those things you have to concentrate on and walking, we've always taken for granted. We've never really thought about it. And could that be some trigger somewhere in the brain where it's just so natural that we're not having that that actual thought process? And maybe that's where the beats and the visual cues, because now we're tying into something else really more on an emotional, psychological level that's feeding us. I, I don't know. I, I'm, a, I'm a big believer with dementia and neurological diseases that we, when we feel connected, when we feel purposeful, it seems to uh, subdue a lot of symptoms for a lot of people on a lot of levels. And many say, you know, they've never felt as purposeful as they are until the disease hit. And they really feel that having that purpose, being an advocate, um, getting out there, they feel has slowed the disease down or um, subdued their symptoms in a lot of ways um, compared to others. And, you know, I just hear all these little pieces and stuff, and I'm no scientist, but I, I think purpose and belonging and that sense of satisfaction um, and maybe even that challenge in terms of what we're doing, I, I think... I think they have more meaning than what we think. Laura, I think you explained much better than I did. I think we got, like get caught up with like big terms and all the EEG testing and all the brain beats of it and everything. But it is so much aligned with what you're saying. We are actually preparing for an animation that is so much more easier for people with Parkinson's and like any other people to understand what the theory is, what is the background story. Um, we will, um, of course, like publish it as soon as it is ready. But I think, Laurie, I think you kind of like what you mentioned that aligns really well with where you know, the scientific background is going at. Well, good. So I'm, I'm not too cray cray then. <laughs> well, I think you're somewhere as a fessor. I'll be honest with you, I think you're, you're spot on. So <laughs> just to give you my day yesterday. Um, so I had a couple of interviews with people and I was on a, um, a support group and then I was at the party. By the time I'd finished at the party, um, my wife said to me, you haven't taken any medication today. And... I didn't even notice that I needed it. And that's because 
all of being on shows like this gives me the buzz I need to keep going. So it's extremely important one because I, I enjoy doing what I do, but for my own health as well, when the day is sort of buzzing and I'm on the move all day and I'm thinking, right, I've got to do this next and I've got to do that, I actually feel a lot better in myself, um, which leads to me walking better. And I often say to my sort of um, movement expert, um, I've said to him, what do the actual pills do for me? Um, and that's sort of after three years because I have days when I don't take, well, I, I forget to take them um, and it has no effect on me at all. But then for other people, if they forget to take two of their pills, it has a dramatic effect. And so that's something they're trying to figure out with me currently. I'm uh, on the table with a load of professors to discuss why some days I don't need the pills and they don't seem to have that dramatic effect. And I'm sure it's because I'm so busy doing lots of sort of local things um, as well, not just the global stuff. One question I want to ask, because this is something common that I hear from from people is, you know, they, they kind of get that adrenaline rush, that purpose, they're feeling good, you know, they're, they're in the zone, whatever you want to call it. But then, holy crap, they are exhausted for a couple of days afterwards because it just takes a lot from them. Do you find that with Parkinson's too? Uh, yes, I, I have the same, the same sort of situation as well. Um, so if I'm going on my walk that I'll be doing again, hopefully in the summer, and trying to do the 3.5 kilometers, it'll give, take me a day to get over it or two days. And that was the pro that's the problem I have if I was working full time, because I would go up to London. I did a lot of work in a lot of the hospitals in London. I used to put in video equipment. Um, I used to project manage it. So by the time I'd got up there and um, I'd gone to the meetings, done the, seen the project and supervised it, then trying to get back home to the station to get the train. So it used to take me an hour just to walk a mile because I was so tired. And I can always remember every time I used to walk past, I became very friendly with a homeless person. And he always used to say to me as I was coming back, he'd say, hello, mate, how are you? In sort of his London accent. I said, oh, I'm all right. He said, you look absolutely awful. Do you want me to give you some help to the, to the train? And we always used to have a laugh. And I did. I used to feel really awful. And I used to, people used to say to me, oh, are you okay? And I said, well, my goal is to get on that train. And once I'm on the train, my goal is to recover <laughs> before thinking about getting off of that train. Um, and because I'm sort of reasonably sort of confident person, I don't sort of really get flustered. But the energy it takes to do what I used to do is immense. And then it used to take me the weekend to get over before Monday. And I'd feel quite ill, you know, I'd sleep all the time and, and you know, wasn't feeling well. And that was the point when I gave up work because I realised I couldn't carry on. Um, because I, I, in some ways, I actually think I would be quite seriously ill by now. Thank you for answering that. Um, Richard, what are some other things that need to change in the world of, of Parkinson's to improve quality of life? Right. The, the main thing that needs to change is that everybody um, with Parkinson's from diagnosis onwards um, is basically treated in the same way. Unfortunately, not just in sort of countries like Africa, but in the Western world, and that includes the United States and Great Britain. If you're basically part of a big university hospital and you've got loads of funds, the treatment and the team that's behind you is immense. So basically, as a Parkinson's person, I should have a qualified dietitian because diet is also extremely important. I should have a qualified physiotherapist. I should have a movement expert. And if required, I should have somebody who can help me with my mental health. So if you're in certain areas, um, you get that type of team. But if you're in an area where I live, you get none of that at all. So this has been one of my campaigns for a long time, that people are not given the knowledge of what to do. So basically, the message that you get when you're diagnosed, eight times out of ten, is from the neurologist, well, you've got Parkinson's, here's a set of pills, take them four times a day, and I'll hopefully see you in six months' time. 
Well, that is not good enough, yeah, for people with Parkinson's. One, they should be given information, which they often aren't. And that's where a lot of them, unfortunately, go home and everybody thinks of Parkinson's as a little grey man bent over a walking stick with his head down and struggling to walk down the pavement. Well, Parkinson's is nothing like that now. The actual images is about getting out there, finding that support, learning what the condition is and not hiding behind the front door. Um, and because that information is not given out, unfortunately, 80% of Parkinson's people never ever reach the support they should have. Well, you know what's interesting is you mentioned having that team around you with, with diet, movement, mental health, and so forth. Every single person should have that in their life. I mean, that would cut down on obesity. I mean, there's there's so many so many aspects, but again, that would be about prevention. And do, do insurance companies, medical companies really want to prevent or, or cure? And, you know, that's been a battle going on for years and years and years, though it's coming more to the forefront and, and there's more demands for that team approach that to me makes so, so much sense overall. Um, Lucy, I want to ask you, what is the vision for charcoal? Where, what are your next steps? Where do you go? You had mentioned that COVID has pushed this out. You know, Richard really wants this device, but he can't have it yet. And how can people get it? And is it available, you know, around the world or is it limited? Where, where are you at? So right now we are still a very small startup out of university. Recently, we were very, very um, lucky with getting support from Cambridge University, Imperial College and Royal College Bar. So we've been getting amazing support. We are currently pushing ourselves as soon as possible. So, you know, get the devices to people with Parkinson's who are waiting. Um, so that is our like short term goal to get this out there. And what is actually more important is actually getting feedback from people with Parkinson's and their carers and everyone, because only with the feedbacks and only with the, all the information we can just make it better. So our goal is to not just um, like launch Q1 and get it to people, but we want to continue our study. What else can we do? Is it like what is the stimulation? What is to optimize? And depending on what kind of activities, for example, what Richard mentioned about when he wants to turn over on the bed, when he wants to walk, what is the best optimized care? So we will continuously study and listen to people with Parkinson's, see what else we can do. And it doesn't actually limit with people with Parkinson's. As I mentioned, like my both of my grandma does have Alzheimer's. Like we are continuously studying and seeing what else can we do. People with Parkinson's is our main area at the moment. But as we our team gets bigger with like-minded people with the same vision of improving quality of life for people with neurodegenerative conditions, what else can we do? So we will continuously um, doing our best. We will do the research. We will develop things. We will test with people. We will listen to people, um, and you know, just take that little part in their journey to make them you know feel like they're a cat feel like there is some like a group of people caring so much about them so just to clarify um this is something that can be purchased it's not a clinical study correct so uh, yes yes that's absolutely true so right now we are doing it parallel so clinical trial is being ready but also because it is a non-invasive device that has a really a lot of study references out there we are launching the device right now we will start with uk and eu um, but because we're getting a lot of interest from us we are just about to kick off uh, roots of like fda clearance um, so that we can get the devices for US. We just got contacted by um, Canada like this week. So we will start investigating how can we spread the device um, to the all over the world. So, you know, we can just make that tiny difference in individual's life. Um, yeah, so like both are really important. Our aim is to actually have all the data, all the clinical trials, economic, you know, health economics done and everything so people can get the devices free. Um, so yeah, we, we're taking baby steps um, until we can make big impact. 
Okay. Well, and we need to connect on Dementia Map because Dementia Map would be a great place for you to be positioned. It's a global resource directory for people, and um, I think that would be a wonderful way to be able to get your word out there. Same, Richard, with you and your group, you know, even your Facebook group, because again, I think one of the, the things that is so important is to keep people socially connected mm -hmm. and um, be able to find information easily with that. In close um, Richard, I want to ask you who in your life has has inspired you to be so positive and, and upbeat in terms of dealing with all this? Um, well, I, I wouldn't be able to do what I can I currently do without my wife. Um, and I think with everybody, see Lucy's nodding. I had to say that. Um, but she's been behind me all the way. And um, with the technical stuff I don't know, she does know. So we sort of work together. But I would say that as an inspiration behind me, it was the first thing that I saw when I got diagnosed. And that was a, um, a YouTube video. It's no longer out there, um, which was a tribute to a gentleman called Tom Isaacs. And he was um, head of Parkinson's Cure. And that was the first video I saw of people like me doing silly things and singing a very motivational song. And I looked at all those people and I said to my wife, that's where I need to be. I need to be out with all these people doing all these silly things that they're doing um, because I'm not the type of person that can sit at home. Um, but what I found is, is that obviously as I've moved through, I've met many inspirational people and my sense of humor sort of helps me a lot. But I'm now starting to diverse. Um, and so I'm now a very active member of um, the Hampshire Disability Forum in my county. And I've been invited on to helping to design the new hospital for disabled people. So my reach is going from Parkinson's into other generic um, sort of avenues. Um, and sort of, I will add one thing with Lucy here, I just so I make sure I still own our good books. And the reason, I think the reason why so many people align themselves with charcoal is because of the sort of kindness and understanding that they give to people with Parkinson's. And even though I push her and keep saying, when am I getting the device? I fully understand. And I've learned a lot through, you know, what they're doing, but they are a very, dynamic sort of young team with lots of enthusiasm so they're, they're the type of people that i like to work for because um um we have considerable amounts of um sort of i think fun doing it and i think they enjoy speaking to me because um absolutely I'm, sort of a, well, I'm a bit younger than what i see but the, the other thing i think that's amazed me is some of the other things i've got involved with so i'm currently doing some work with stanford university and Southampton, so in the States and Southampton. Um, and some of these um, developments that are occurring in the field are absolutely tremendous going forward. Um, and really, I just want to try and bring it to as many people as possible. Wonderful. Now, again, you can reach Richard on Facebook. Um, he, he's got a couple of different pages. One is Parkinson's Vision. The other is Rickety Warrior. And the third one is uh, Parky and Rickety on Facebook. He also has a, a Twitter handle of Rickety PD. So thank you so much. Richard, do you want to give people out a, an email address or is Facebook the best? Um, you can contact me on any of them, but I do have a, um, an email address, which is ricketywarrior, one word, at gmail.com. And when people look at the Parky video, let me give you a quick definition of that. That is to do with the World Parkinson's Congress, which is due to happen in June 2020 in Barcelona. And Parky, for the last two years, has followed me around. So there's pictures of one of Lucy and one of her colleagues on it. So everywhere I go, Parky comes with me and everyone has a picture with him. Okay, wonderful. Sounds good. And Lucy, for you, people can go to your website, charcoalneurotech.com, and they can email at infocharco 
neurotech.com as well. And do you have a YouTube channel? Because I know you've got a great video out there as well that people might want to see. Yes, we do have a YouTube channel. It's not easily accessible because we still have a generic um, URL at the moment. But on our website, we have all of the testing uh, videos. Um, I'm sure there is like some videos with Richard as well. So you can actually see lots of testimonials and um, us actually working on the device um, and lots of things on our website. Um, that will be Shaku Neurotech slash um, videos. Okay, wonderful. Well, and that, that makes it easier for people. They don't have to go go someplace else. Well, thank you so much. This has been um, really informative. I Like I said, I, I learned a lot today. I love the direction that you're going with your company. And, and Richard, I just love your enthusiasm and positive approach to, to living with Parkinson's. So thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you so you. much.